before we study Acts 10, remember that it's important that you be able to think your way through the book of Acts chapter by chapter. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus gives his final commission to the disciples, the apostles. And in verse 8, he outlines the book of Acts from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost part of the world. The ascension takes place in Acts 1, and the replacement of Judas with Matthias takes place in Acts 1. Acts 2 is probably the most important chapter in the book of Acts. That is the great miracle of the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost when the Christians are filled with the Holy Spirit and they speak in languages that they had never learned to people who had always known those languages and so they evangelize them in that miraculous way. In chapter 3 we have the healing of the blind man and the great furor and controversy that it causes in Jerusalem. In chapter 4 we have the beginning of persecution. In chapter 5 we have the great test internally through the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira lying to the Holy Spirit and how they are dramatically and summarily judged by instant death. In Acts 6, we have the choosing of the seven. We are calling them the first deacons, even though it doesn't say that in the text. Prominent among those deacons are Stephen and Philip, who will play a more dramatic role later. It's important to note, too, that we idealize the church in Jerusalem. We have a tendency to think, well, that was a perfect church. Our churches are not like that today. But it wasn't a perfect church. One reason we know the Scripture is true, because the Scripture is uh, freely reveals the bad things that were going on in model people. Think of the sin of Abram with his wife in chapter tw Genesis 12. And then when his name was changed to Abraham, his sin with his wife in, in Genesis chapter 20. The terrible thing that he did. Think of the terrible thing that David did with Bathsheba. These are, these are great heroes of the faith, and yet the Bible faithfully reports their terrible sins showing that Scripture is not sugarcoating things. Scripture is not overlaying what happens with exaggeration and with optimism, which is unwarranted. But Scripture tells us the truth about who we really are and what the church really is. So in Acts 5, we're told that there were two liars in the church who were hypocritical, who were pretending to give everything to God when really they were not. And in Acts 6, we're told that the women who ought to have been the godliest people in the church. These older widows who should have known better were fighting with each other because one group was saying they're getting more than we are. And so they were making a big deal out of it. And that was settled by the appointment of seven people whom we call deacons. In Acts chapter 7, we see the great sermon and the martyrdom of Stephen, the, one of the first deacons who was also one of the first martyrs. He preaches this long sermon he charges his accusers with guilt. They're accusing him of guilt. He accuses them of guilt, and they kill him. And for the first time, this new personality is mentioned, this Pharisee persecutor called Saul. In Acts chapter 8, the persecution moves the Christians out of Jerusalem. They go into Samaria, marking a new geographical transition in the book of Acts. Philip works signs and wonders. And then the focus of Scripture comes upon one man, probably a black man, an African, an Ethiopian. He was a representative of a great king, Philip entered his, of a great queen. Philip entered his chariot as the representative of a great king. He was over the treasure of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. Philip distributed him the, the treasury of the king of kings, the most high God the Lord Jesus Christ. We see his conversion. We see his baptism in Acts chapter 8 as he's going on home, rolling down the road toward Africa in his chariot. In Acts chapter 9, probably the second most chapter, most important chapter in the book of Acts because it contains the dramatic conversion with a personal, by a personal uh, confrontation with Christ himself on the road to Damascus, one of the great enemies of the church, the persecutor, is turned into one of the great heroes of the church. Saul of Tarsus becomes a believer on the road to Damascus.
and he begins to witness. He begins to debate in the synagogue, proving from Scripture Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, the predicted one, the promised Messiah. Okay, that's how far we've gotten in the book of Acts. That gets us to chapter 10. And in chapter 10, we encounter a Gentile called uh, Cornelius. One of the things that I mentioned yesterday is that one of the great proofs that the gospel is real, one of the great proofs that the gospel comes to us in power is the capacity of the gospel to change us, to make us different, to give us the power to lay aside our prejudices. You know, one of the strongest things in the world is racial prejudice. One of the strongest things in the world is the conviction that our nation, our country, our race is the best nation, the great, the, the, the best race, and that all others are inferior to us. We make a distinction in the English language. We have this word patriotism. And patriotism, which comes from the word father, patriotism is a beautiful thing. It's a good thing. It's a right thing. What patriotism means is, I love my country because it is my country. That's good. That's right. That's to be encouraged. We should love our country, our nation, because it is our country, just as we love our families. A nation is only a collection of families. But there's another word, and that word is nationalism. And nationalism is an ugly word. Nationalism is a bad thing. Nationalism is a thing that we should resist. What's the difference? Patriotism says, I love my country because it is my country. Nationalism says, I hate your country because it is not my country. That's wrong. And if we're Christians, we need to repent. Probably, probably, the greatest Christian nation in the world is South Korea. That's where they have the most fervent Christians, the most prayerful Christians, the most dynamic missionaries. It's amazing what God has done in South Korea. Not America, not Western Europe. Western Europe is post-Christian. America is becoming post-Christian. But South Korea. I was in South Korea once for 11 days, and something amazed me. I was talking with a very godly girl. She was deaconess in a church. She was one of the few Korean female speakers at the great conference that I'd come to. This was in a long time ago, before most of you were born, 1984. And I was asking her about missions in East Asia. I asked her about China, and I asked her about Japan. When I asked her about Japan, she said, oh, we hate them. It amazed me. She was a sweet, tiny girl, a radiant Christian. But when I mentioned Japan, Japan had invaded Korea, had occupied Korea over a period of off and on for 300 years. Her Korean nationalism took over. She was a, a very committed Christian, but at that moment, her Korean nationalism overwhelmed her Christianity. And she said about the Japanese, oh, we hate them. I used to travel in Eastern Europe during the Soviet period before the fall of the Iron Curtain, and I would travel to the different countries. The country I was most impressed with in terms of the commitment to Christ and knowledge of the Bible was Romania. The Romanian Christians were amazing. They suffered a lot. Their economy was terrible. Their life was hard, but they loved the Lord. But I remember once being with a group of Romanians in Western Romania, and I mentioned Transylvania. There's a great dispute between Romania and the Hungarians. After World War I, Transylvania was taken away from Hungary and given to Romania. And when I mentioned Transylvania, these Romanians, very godly, very committed Christians, all of a sudden they became Romanian nationalists and they talked badly about Hungary and how they had no claim at all to Transylvania. And as I admire the Korean Christians so much, as I admire the Romanian Christians so much, it made me realize what a strong thing nationalism is. What a hard thing it is to root out. 
and how we must fight it. Now, let me just tell you something. Any nationalism that any of us feel, any nationalism that the South Koreans might feel, any nationalism that the Romanians might feel, was nothing compared to what the Jews thought about the Gentiles. The Jews believed that the Gentiles were low, inferior, like animals. They were not worthy to be in the presence of Jews. They were not worthy to have social interaction with Jews, to share a meal with Jews. You've got to understand the mindset of the first century to understand the difference that the Scripture made. Several years ago, there was an Israeli part-time soldier who was on security duty at a mosque in Jerusalem while the Muslims were worshiping, and his machine gun was loaded. He was an American Jew, a doctor named Baruch Goldstein, and he pointed his machine gun at the Muslim Palestinian worshipers and began shooting and he killed several of them before he himself, while he was reloading, was grabbed and wrestled down and beaten to death by those Muslims who were taking vengeance on his murder. A terrible thing. He was a fanatic, a fanatic who hated Muslims and decided that he was going to kill as many as he could before he died. At his funeral, the rabbi who was also a fanatic, instead of feeling bad about it, instead of apologizing, instead of asking the forgiveness of the Muslims, defended what this man did, this terrible, terrible murderer, defended what he did. And in his speech, in his sermon at the funeral, at the memorial service, he said that all the Arabs were not worth the, the fingernail of one Jew. That's what he said. Now, this is the way these people think when they're overcome with nationalism and fanaticism. But the attitude of that fanatic rabbi who preached Baruch Goldstein's funeral would not have been uncommon among first century Jews. So these are the prejudices these are the attitudes that the Holy Spirit has to overcome. The Holy Spirit has to change as the gospel goes out. And that's what happens. That's what begins to happen in Acts chapter 10 in the story of Cornelius. Now, in Acts 10.1, we're told that Cornelius was a Roman soldier. This would have made the Jews hate him even more because he was a part of the invading power and the conquering power and the occupying conqueror. The Romans ruled the known, the known world and they ruled Palestine. They ruled Israel. And for that, they would have been all the more hated. So we learned that he was a brave soldier. We also learned in verse 2 that he was a devout man. That is, he was a spiritual man. And Genesis 10 too says he was a God-fearer. When you read the New T Testament, you will discover that there is a class of people who are not known as Jews, but they're also not known merely as Gentiles. They're known as God-fearers. They were seekers. They had become convinced that the truth lay within the religion of Israel and that the God whom the Jews worshipped was the true God. They were not quite totally converted yet. They had not become Jewish converts or Jewish pro proselytes, but they were convinced intellectually that Judaism contained the truth, and they were exploring. They were trying to learn more. They were on a road. They were on the road to conversion. This is a class of people who sometimes referred to as God-fearers. Cornelius was a God-fearer, and he was attending upon the religious observances of the Jews, and he actually gave away money to Jewish people, and it, said, and it says in verse 2 that he uh, prayed continually. Okay, now that's the man that the vision comes to. He has a vision, and he's told that his prayers are answered, and he's told, go get Simon. Go get Simon Peter. 
He's told that in verse 5. Okay, I want us to think about this for a moment. As human beings, when we're reasoning as humans, we look upon the world and it's very hard for us to believe that people who have not heard of Christ are people who will be condemned when they die, people who will not be in heaven. This is a hard thought. It seems to be an uncivilized thought. It seems to be a harsh thought. We have a tendency to think, well, you know, there's so many good people in the world. There's so many deserving people in the world. Jesus actually talks about this category of people. If you were with us in the study of the Gospel of John, we talked about this. And we'll talk about it just a minute again now in reference to Cornelius. Here's a Gentile who really was a good man. Here's a Gentile who really was deserving. So what happens? He hears the gospel and he's saved. Jesus talks about a person like this in John 3.21. If you look at John 3.21, it says this, He who practices the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So what's John 3.21 telling us? Okay, John 3.21 tells us that a person who's doing the right thing will eventually find God. Why? Because the reality is that God has already found him. That's the reason he's doing the right thing. Cornelius was a person like that. Cornelius is going to find God because God has already found Cornelius. That's why Cornelius was devout. That's why he was prayerful. That's why he gave alms. That's why he was attracted to the religion of Israel. That's why he was a God-fearer. That's why he was a worshiper. So John 3.21 is a verse to master. The second verse in John is to be found in John 6.45. John 6.45 says, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. That's what Jesus says. And, and basically what Jesus is saying is that everyone who has a true knowledge of God will come to Christ. You think, well, there are all these people out there worshiping the true God, but they don't know anything about Jesus. Let me tell you something. If they're worshiping the true God, they will know something about Jesus. They will find Jesus because God has already shown them grace. God never shows himself to anybody without showing his son to anybody. You may find that hard to believe, but it's a truth that Jesus himself teaches, and it's a truth that's borne out and proven in our missionary experience. Cornelius was in that category. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. The third verse is to be found in John 7, John 7:17. 7, John 7:17 7, says this: If any man is willing, to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. That is, if there exists anywhere, anyone who's willing to do God's will, they will learn of Christ's teaching and they will come to know who Christ is and where he gets his authority. Cornelius was in that category. And John 7:17 7, speaks about a man called Cornelius about a man like Cornelius. The last verse is in the interview with Pilate on the last night of Jesus' life. John 18, 37. John 18, 37. And that teaches that anyone who's a real friend of the truth will hear of Jesus. Um, Jesus says to Pilate, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now, when you put all these verses together, John 3.21, John 6.45, John 7.17, John 18.37, the cumulative impact is significant. And it tells us something very important 
about the people in the world who don't know the gospel yet, who've not heard the gospel yet. Cornelius was in that category. That Cornelius was moving toward the truth. Cornelius was moving toward Christ. And so Cornelius had a vision. He was favored with um, a, vi a vision of angels and he was given instructions. Why do people have visions? Why do people see angels? First of all, I'm not sure it's something we should really desire. This is not so much true in, in Cornelius' case, but in the case of almost everyone else. If you, see a, if, you have, uh, if you see an angel, usually it means there's something terribly hard that you have to do. And sometimes God sends an angel that we think that, that'd be a miracle, that would be impossible. Well, yeah, that's right, it is a miracle, and it is impossible. In, in our ordinary experience, people don't see angels. People don't talk to angels. If that ever happens, it usually means we're about to receive an assignment that's going to be very, very difficult. As a matter of fact, usually the first thing an angel says is, don't be afraid. And the reason an angel says, don't be afraid, is not only because his appearance is scary, but because what you're about to be told to do is also going to be really scary. So we're told not to be afraid. Um, it says, for instance, that Cornelius was very alarmed. This is Acts 10, verse 4. He's afraid. He says, what is it, Lord? And then he's told to, um, to go and find Peter. And this is a very interesting phenomenon. The angel doesn't tell him what to do. The angel tells him who to talk to. It's a human being who will give him his instructions. It's a human being who will teach him the gospel, not an angel. God has given this job to fallen, imperfect human beings who are themselves saved by grace and washed in blood. The job is not given to unfallen, perfect angels. The job is given to fallen, sinful human creatures like you and like me. And so, um, an impossible event, the appearance of an angel, is usually given to announce a, a difficult thing or to explain another impossible thing or another miraculous thing. And this is what happens in the case of um, Cornelius. He's told that God has heard his prayers, that his prayers have not been in vain. Okay, why Peter? Why does Peter have to play such a prominent role? Remember what we said about the position of the apostles. The apostles lead the gospel advance. The gospel advance comes through the apostles. It is true that Philip in Acts 8 was not an apostle, but it is also true that Philip in Acts 6 had, his hands, had the hands of the apostles laid on him. So Philip got his authority from the apostles. And it's also true that when the Samaritans began to come to Christ, that Peter and John were sent into Samaria from the church in Jerusalem to certify as apostles that what was happening among the Samaritans was something that was coming from God. Now we see a similar thing. God is ready to bring the Gentiles into the fold. God is ready to expand the gospel and the salvation which comes through Jesus to the whole earth. It's not a peculiar possession of the Jews only, but a gift that God is giving to the whole earth. So at that moment, Peter is the gatekeeper. Peter is standing at the door. You know, I don't know how it is in Russian thought, but in English thought, there's almost this mythological idea that when we get to heaven, Peter is at the gate, and Peter admits people. That's not true but it's, it's a very well-known idea, and it's kind of a garbled, distorted interpretation of the truth that Peter plays uh, a key role. And speaking of keys, turn to Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, Jesus mentions the church for the first time. And there's a very important exchange with Peter. In Matthew 16, 19, Peter says, uh, Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Peter is going to be used to certify 
whether it's time for the Gentiles to be admitted to heaven. Will salvation expand beyond the Jews? Will it be time? Who will be the first Jews who will enter? God will use Peter to make that determination as Jesus promised in Matthew 16. So Acts chapter 10 is actually a fulfillment of what Jesus says about Peter having the keys in Matthew 16, 19. This is the amazing fulfillment of what's taking place. And as we see the progress of the gospel in Samaria, Acts 8, Peter is sent down to the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 10. It's Peter who has the prominent role. When Cornelius is given a vision, the content of the vision is you go find Peter, Simon Peter. He'll tell you what to do. He'll tell you what's going on. So this authority is given to Peter by Jesus, Matthew chapter 16. This authority is always assumed in the book of Acts. We see Peter preaching the sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We see Jesus speaking for the Christian community to the Jewish authorities in Acts chapter 5. We see Peter advancing the gospel into Samaria and certifying that the gospel has really come to the Samaritans. The Holy Spirit has really come to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. And we see the same thing among the Gentiles in chapter 10. Now, the authority is not absolute. In other words, Peter is not some kind of pope and he decides if it's going to be this way or that way. Peter is not the source of the authority. Peter is the channel of the authority. It's not that Peter decides and he makes the decision on his own. No, God decides and announces the decision through Peter. We see that Philip plays a role. Philip gets to the Samaritans before Peter does in Acts chapter 8. So it's not like Peter is the absolute only person that God is using. Also, if you turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, now obviously there's a great controversy which exists between Protestant Christians and Roman Catholic and Orthodox Christians about how Peter's authority is passed on. Those Roman Catholic churches especially, and I suppose the Orthodox churches in some respect, believe that Peter's authority is passed on through human successors, which comes down to the Roman Catholic Church or which comes down to the Orthodox Church. Actually, Peter talks about the fact that he's about to die in 2 Peter chapter 1. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, he talks about the authority coming through the Scripture. He's about to die. He says this. So, he, he says that in 2 Peter 1, 13. 2 Peter is the last thing that he wrote. In chapter 1, 13, he says, I know I'm about to die. I know I'm about to lay aside my earthly dwelling. So what does he do? He talks about the fact that he's written everything down. He says in verse 15 that when I'm gone, you'll be able to call these things to mind. How? Through a human successor? No but through what is written, through Holy Scripture. And in the next verses to the end of the chapter, he talks about the importance of Holy Scripture and he talks about the authority of Holy Scripture. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, 
Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300, or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.